Today on Blue 58, let's take a moment to check in on how the Packers draft picks are performing so far this year. Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast to thepowersweep.com. I'm your host, John Meerdink. Happy to be with you here for another episode. I figured since we've got kind of a little interstitial period between games here, we'd take a second and just pause and look at how one particular segment of the Packers roster is doing. Packers didn't play yesterday. They don't play again until Sunday. That's what Thursday games do to you. So let's take a second and look at the rookies on the roster. The Packers were kind of in a unique situation this year where they had rookies who were in a position to play a lot, but they didn't necessarily have to count on to be super huge contributors. At just about every position where they had a high-end rookie draft pick, they also had someone else, a veteran, who would be counted on ahead of them. So Rashawn Gary is behind Preston and Zadarius Smith. Darnell Savage is behind, well, not behind, but adjacent to Adrian Amos. Even uh, Elton Jenkins uh, had Lane Taylor ahead of him, has Billy Turner there, has a couple veteran guys on either side of him, no matter where he's playing on the offensive line. They're not going to have to do it themselves. That said, you're still expecting some sort of production from them. So let's dive into some of those raw numbers and and look at where the these players are. We'll look at the snaps they've played and a couple notable stats for each of them uh, to this point. And then we'll make a determination whether these guys are where we expected them to be so far, ahead of where we expected, or behind where we expected. Because no matter what they're contributing as a rookie, None of these guys are going to be finished products yet, and the Packers are hoping that they'll grow and become something better than they, they were when they came into the league. So how are they doing in that process? Where are they in their development curve? What this is not going to be is a commentary on who the Packers should have picked instead. I don't like to do that at all, and I think people who listen to this show regularly will uh, will understand that. I think you get the guys that you get, and it's not like our opinion really, really makes any kind of difference. I don't have enough of a substantive opinion on draft picks to really weigh in ahead of the draft on who the Packers should pick, and I think if you're making that determination now, you're just playing the results. I mean, if you couldn't predict this ahead of the draft— uh, good. I guess that's good for you if you think that the guys who turned out to be good would have been good good to pick. Well, that, that's really, really insightful. If you had that insight ahead of the draft, I, I guess that's good for you as well. I don't, and, and that's not the kind of show that I'm capable of doing. What I would rather do is cover the guys that we do have, so let's talk about, about those guys. Starting with the Packers' first pick in the draft, Rashawn Gary, taken 12th overall in the first round. So far, Gary has played just 64 snaps on defense and has managed just one sack so far. That doesn't sound like a lot, but this is pretty much exactly where I thought he would be. Maybe a little bit behind in snaps, but I didn't think there was going to be a big role for Rashawn Gary this year. We didn't expect a big statistical year. My prediction for him was fewer than five sacks. He's pretty much on track for that. This is about what Rashawn Gary is going to be this year. He's a rotational pass rusher. He comes in for athleticism and explosiveness in the pass rush off the bench. When Zadarius Smith or Preston Smith kick inside, he's there to rush from the edge and give the Packers that athletic juice. He has played a little bit more over the past couple weeks, and his one sack was super encouraging, so I think the arrow is pointing up on Rashawn Gary. But this, I think, is pretty much what he was going to be this year. It wasn't going to be you know, the top half of the defense in overall snap counts. That may change. There may be injuries ahead of him, but I think if the Packers have their ideal situation, this is pretty much what he's going to be. You can quibble or not whether that's a good thing to get out of the 12th overall pick. I certainly levied that criticism in the past, but this is what we've got, and I think that's what the Packers are going to do with him. That's why our expectations for him are where they are. Pretty good so far. About where I thought he'd be We'll probably see slightly more of him in the weeks and months to come, but I think this is this is more or less the the overall impression of Rashawn Gary that we're going to get. Not so the next guy in the list, Darnell Savage, the 21st overall pick in the draft, the second first round pick for the Packers this spring. So far this season, he's played a whopping 271 snaps on defense. Can't do any better than that because that's 100% of the defensive snaps so far. And he has managed to snag one interception along with breaking up a few passes as well. Darnell Savage is way, way ahead of where 
I thought he would be a quarter of the way into his rookie season. I figured he'd be a starter. I figured he would contribute maybe a couple plays, but there would be some significant growing pains too. But I didn't think he'd look so much like he belonged in the Packers defense. That's a testament both to him and the things that the Packers have had him doing. They haven't gotten him out of position or where he's been super vulnerable. One of the criticisms of Savage that the, that I saw a lot of people pointing his way as, as the Packers made that selection and as it was analyzed was he tended to get beat in pass coverage uh, with a fair bit of regularity, even down the seam which is something that was a little counterintuitive because he has that great speed. The Packers haven't put him in a situation where that's going to happen. It helps to have a really good pass rush so you don't end up with a lot of those deep passes that could get passed a guy like Darnell Savage, but it, it really hasn't happened so far. That's not to say he hasn't made mistakes. He has. That, For instance, the, the Dalvin Cook touchdown run was more or less completely his fault. He got into the secondary Savage did not make a great attempt at a tackle there, and suddenly Dalvin Cook's off to the races for a 75-yard touchdown. But even those growing pains have still been more or less ahead of the curve. Veteran players still make mistakes like that, and the encouraging thing from Savage is he hasn't made the same mistake again. He even stopped a touchdown against the Eagles on a very similar play. I think he's learning from those mistakes, and hopefully he doesn't continue to, uh, to make the same mistakes again. That was one of the things... If we can circle back to last year for a second, that was really impressive about both Marquez Valdez-Scantling and Equinemius St. Brown. Neither of them made the same mistake twice. Even within the same game, you'd see them mess up slightly on a route. Rodgers would talk to them, and then they'd get it straightened out and run the same route again later in the game and have, uh, have it work out better, just because they had sharpened things up even within the course of a game. Darnell Savage seems to be much in the same vein there. He is making those adjustments on a week-to-week basis, even within games. He's doing a great job there. That's been encouraging to see. Now to Elton Jenkins, a second-round pick, 44th overall. He's played 153 snaps on offense so far, took over in spurts for Lane Taylor, and then now has slid into the uh, starting lineup with Lane Taylor's injury. So far this year, he hasn't had a holding penalty or given up a sack, According to Stats Inc. via the Washington Post, he has had one false start, but that's really been the only measurable blemish on his resume so far. Like Savage, he too is ahead of where I thought he'd be. I predicted he'd be a starter by now. I said by week five, and I'm still counting it even though it came via injury. But I didn't think it'd be quite as seamless as it has been. Even as a guy who was highly touted, fairly highly touted, coming out of out of college, he has come in and the offensive line has not missed a beat. And that's tougher than people would think. I think a lot of people think it's it's fairly easy to plug and play a guy who's taken pretty high in the draft. It, there's a lot to learn, even if you're playing a relatively simple position within the overall offensive line scheme like guard as compared to tackle or center. It, it's still a transition. Just the physicality alone can be difficult for some guys to handle. Now there's a long way to go. 153 snaps is not all that many in the grand scheme of things, but it's been pretty good so far, and the Packers look like they have a good one in Elton Jenkins. Jay Sternberger, the 75th overall pick, we're going to kind of have to take a pass on because he's been on injured reserve so far this season. He has recorded no stats, and therefore we can't really say where he is in comparison to where we thought he would be. But if the overall thinking was that the Packers really wouldn't count on him much this year, well, I guess that's been true. So at least in one respect, he's been exactly where we thought he would be. Kingsley Kiki, the man whose name always makes me smile. Packers took him 150th overall, a fifth round pick. So far, Kiki has played just 19 snaps on defense, was a healthy scratch in there for a couple games. He is behind where I thought he would be. And that's probably, as much as anything, a missed assessment on my part. That's partly because of the way that it works just for defensive linemen. It takes a while to transition into the pro game. Much like offensive linemen, it can take a little bit of uh, time to get used to the the increased level of physical play. But I, I still thought that he would play more than he has so far. He really hasn't gotten much in the way of opportunities, but I thought with some of the injuries on the defensive line, the departure of Mike Daniels, he'd get more of a shot. That hasn't been the case. Again, it's worth remembering how tough the transition is for big guys. You go from being a man among boys, if you're dominating on the defensive line uh, in college, even in a place like the SEC, to being a man among a bunch of other big, talented, strong, athletic men. That can be tough. And that has been the case for Kingsley Kiki so far. He can't really get into the lineup in a super regular way. 
Same has kind of been true for Kadar Holman, the Packers' first of two sixth-round picks. The Packers took him 185th overall, and so far he's been a healthy scratch in every game this year. As a result, he's behind where I thought he'd be, but that's largely shaped by the amount of attention he got in camp. He was one of the darlings of camp, at least early on, but guys like Chandon Sullivan and some others really rallied late. He made the roster, but hasn't really done much so far. I haven't given up hope. I think there's still a chance he plays this year. There's still a chance he could contribute in some aspects this year, probably on special teams. But like others, getting used to the athletic level of the NFL, there is a big learning curve for Holman coming from Toledo to the NFL. I love a little action as much as the next guy, but it's a big jump going from that to the National Football League. A guy who was a, an extreme athlete among other good athletes in college is just now kind of one of the guys in the NFL. That also might be true for Dexter Williams. The Packers' sixth-round pick taken 194th overall, nine picks after Kadar Holman. He, too, has been a healthy scratch in four games so far. Williams is one of the big disappointments for me. He's been way behind where I thought he would be. Thought he would at least be active and gotten a couple reps by now, but Danny Vitale has taken the snaps you'd thought would be going to Williams. Even coming over essentially as a fullback, he's not really a true fullback. He's kind of a hybrid, almost H-back, running back, tight end, fullback hybrid. Still, he's taken the snaps and the the spots in the 46-man roster that would have gone to Williams. I'm going to be very interested to see what the Packers do with Dexter Williams this week with Jamal Williams presumably out. Do they add a back? Do they activate Williams this week? To me, that's probably the, the priority ahead of wide receiver, even if fans are asking for that. I'll be interested to see what sort of role is in line for Dexter Williams. By the way, we will be talking receivers on uh, on Wednesday's podcast. I think I've got a couple of unique takes on that. Finally, among draft picks so far, we got to talk about Ty Summers, the Packers' seventh round pick, taking 226th overall. He is exactly where I thought he would be. He has not played a snap on defense so far, has managed 70 on special teams. Seventh rounders are going to make the team on special teams. That's what he did, and that's what he's done since. It's a bummer what happened to Curtis Bolton, but that's kind of the facts of life in the NFL. Sometimes injuries happen, and sometimes injuries ruin promising young careers. Bolton is at least a year away from uh, getting a shot to show us what he can do as an NFL linebacker. That That is a bummer, but Summers is here instead, and he's soaking up reps on special teams. 70 snaps is quite a few through four games so far. That is as much a good omen as anything for a guy taken in the seventh round. You're on the active roster. You're contributing at least in some way. Good on you so far. That's where the Packers draft class is. I think it's been a pretty solid class so far. I think we've gotten good returns uh, from Elton Jenkins and Darnell Savage in particular. And I think there's reason to be optimistic about a few of the other draft picks. I'm interested to see what we see from Dexter Williams over the course of the rest of the year, as well as Jay Sternberg or whether or not the Packers decide to make him active. Um, if he if he returns from his injury at some point this year. It's going to be an interesting class, and we will check in with them again towards the middle of the season. I wanted to take a second as well today to talk about a couple of our uh, semi-advanced stats or custom stats that we do at the Power Sweep. We're going to talk about three of them so far because I think they have been a good example. Well, let's talk about four. We'll add one more in because two of them kind of go together. Uh, Two offensive and two defensive metrics that I think kind of illustrate some points about the Packers that may may fall a little bit through the cracks. We're going to start with, uh, with our stat called production ratio. This is a measure of how often guys are getting behind the line of scrimmage against opposing offenses. We measure, or we take uh, the number of sacks a guy's had through uh, the amount of games he's played and combine them with the amount of tackles for loss that he's had and divide them by the amount of games that he's played. You should be at about a one-to-one ratio in sacks and tackles for loss uh, compared to the amount of games you've played. So if you've played four games so far, uh, an average starting caliber front seven player should have a production ratio of about one. Whether it's two sacks and two tackles for loss or one sack and three tackles for loss, whatever that combination happens to be, it should be around one. If you start getting up over one and a half or so, that's pretty elite territory. 
So far this year, two Packers players are in that sort of elite territory. Both Preston Smith and Zadarius Smith are above production ratios of 1.5. Smith, uh, the Preston Smith in particular, is at 1.88 so far this year, and Zadarius is at 1.5. So both at kind of that elite level threshold. The disappointing news is nobody else has gotten close to that so far. Uh, nobody is really racking up significant amounts of tackles for loss. Uh, no one is really uh, penetrating beyond those two. Blake Martinez is the only other one who's really um, performing at a level that you'd expect from a starting caliber player. He's got one sack and three tackles for for loss so far. That's a production ratio of one. If you break out your handy-dandy abacus at home, you should be able to count that up yourself uh, because that is a total of four through four games. That's good to see from him, but you'd hope to see Dean Lowry and uh, and Kenny Clark step up uh, statistically at least a little bit um, over the remainder of the year. Clark does have one and a half sacks, but uh, the rest of it hasn't hasn't been super statistically kind to him so far this year. That number goes hand in hand uh, with the ball hawk index. That's a, a number we track that uh, tracks how often people are getting to the ball on your defense. Uh, a ball hawk is a sack, a pass defensed, an interception, or a forced fumble. So far this year, Preston Smith leads the way with eight and a half. He has uh, four and a half sacks uh, and uh, at least one uh, pass broken up as well as a, a fumble forced. The, the, those exact numbers may not add up, but he, he has four and a half so far, or eight and a half, excuse me, so far, and is therefore leading the Packers. As a whole, the Packers are doing really well this year, but it shows you, this number does, uh, when you look at the team totals, where they failed in week four. So each of the first week th- weeks, uh, three weeks of the season, the Packers had 12 or more ball hawks. They were getting their hand on the ball all the time. Players were getting sacks, pa- players were breaking up passes, uh, players were forcing fumbles and getting interceptions. In week four, they came back to earth in a big way. They only posted two ball hawks. No sacks, no fumbles forced, no interceptions, only two pass breakups, and both of those came from Kevin King. That total of two, that team total of two, is the lowest in the Mike Pettin era, down from a previous low of three. So in 20 games so far, they've only posted a worse total Well, they haven't posted a worse total. Previous low was just three. Packers have to get probably in the 7 to 10 range on a week-by-week basis. That's what you'd be hoping for from their defense. They need to step up going forward. Let's switch over to the offensive side because I think the stats we look at here should paint a fairly rosy picture of what we're uh, for for the Packers uh, so far this season. This should make you feel a little bit better about the offense. The number we're going to talk about here is explosive plays to start. Explosive plays for our purposes are calculated as runs of 12 or more yards and pass receptions of 16 or more yards. We get those numbers from a couple different NFL coaches. That's what the Packers used to use, have used uh, throughout their relatively recent history. Uh, Pete Carroll in Seattle uses a similar figure and a couple other NFL coaches do as well. I'm not sure why those numbers exactly there probably is some sort of math-based reason for that, and we may have to revisit those numbers so far at some point in the future. Those are the numbers we have. We use those numbers because that's what NFL teams have told us that they use. Not us directly, but they've, they've spoken about it publicly, and we've decided to adopt that as well. The Packers have steadily increased the number of explosive plays they've generated so far this year. In weeks one and two, they generated just four explosive plays each game. In week three, they were up to seven, and in week four, they were up to eight. They've gotten increasing numbers of explosive plays from both Devontae Adams and Marquez Valdez-Scantling as well. It's good to see the Packers increasing their totals because that means that things are coming together a little bit more on offense, and those chunk plays are a priority for Matt LaFleur. That's something he mentioned this offseason. That's something he mentioned both uh, with the, the Tennessee Titans and with the Los Angeles Rams, the end even dating back to his time with the Atlanta Falcons, those explosive big yardage plays have always been a priority for this offensive system. And seeing the Packers increase their totals week by week is very encouraging. And if they can keep doing that, even if they stay at about the level they're at, 8 to 9 or 10 per week, that's pretty good. And uh, I think that would be encouraging for the defense as a whole. Finally, 
I want to talk about our newest and most complicated stat. Penalties and sacks per starter's snaps. P-A-S-S-S. Basically, the thinking behind this stat is that it's hard for people who don't have time to break down each and every individual snap to know how the offensive line is doing. That's something that I've struggled with as I've done this because the offensive line is obviously a huge part of a team's performance. And if your offensive line isn't performing well, your offense as a whole probably isn't going to perform particularly well. So how do we gauge an offensive line's performance without um, without having to break down each and every snap of a game? You can't do it perfectly. And even if you did, you may not get the most accurate breakdown because there are differing opinions even within the stat breakdown community or the the film breakdown community. Just look at the difference between the grades that Pro Football Focus gives Billy Turner and what ESPN's uh, pass rush win rate has given him as the the Packers' starting right guard. ESPN says he's been one of the best pass-blocking right guards in football. Pro Football Focus says he's been one of the worst. The truth is probably somewhere in between. This is our attempt to find that truth. So what we do is we take a player's total penalties and their total sacks as reported by Stats Inc. to the Washington Post. They're the only outlet I've been able to find that reports sacks allowed in any sort of authoritative way. We take the total penalties and total sacks a player has given up and normalize it as though he has played 65 snaps per game. 65 is a ballpark figure for what most offenses are putting up per game, 65 total snaps. We just want to compare apples to apples here. We want to compare guys uh, against guys who are playing similar amounts of snap, snaps to them. How often are is Billy Turner giving up a, a sack or committing a penalty versus uh, David Bakhtiari or someone on another team? This gives us the opportunity to compare players across teams as well. So far this season, Billy Turner according to this metric at least, is is uh, is leading a pack for the Packers. He's given up just 0.24 penalties and sacks in 65 or in 267 snaps, excuse me. That's a per 65 rate of 0.24. That's pretty darn good. That's been one of the best figures I've been able to find um, in in recent memory for the Packers and for the league as a whole. The flip side of that is that David Bakhtiari, according to this metric at least, is not having a very good season. He's been penalized four times this year and has given up one sack. That would be a near career worst PASSS rating of 1.22. In fact, it would be his career worst. Previously, uh, the worst season of his career was 2015. He was penalized 11 times that year and gave up six sacks. That's a per 65 rate of 1.1. Six. For comparison, last year he was down to just 0.44, and that was even an increase of the year before where he was at at 0.39. Just reading numbers into a microphone, this is great radio. The point is, this gives us a little bit of insight into uh, how the offensive line has been doing so far this year, and most of the offensive line has been doing pretty well, at least by this metric. It's not perfect. It doesn't reflect uh, the contributions that uh, a quarterback makes or or uh, that a quarterback may cost the offensive line uh, by holding the ball and giving up too many sacks or something like that. But it does give us at least a baseline sort of figure to look at. And by this baseline figure, the Packers' offensive line has been doing fairly well so far this year. One last note on Bakhtiari. I would This number continues to trouble me because of the issues he's had with injuries. Now, in, in week four, we saw him battling uh, what looked like a, a neck injury, maybe a stinger. That's what they were doing on the sideline, testing him pushing up with his shoulders. Um, that would be a concern along with the, the minor back issues that he's had so far this year. I mean, as far as his back issues go, I hesitate to call any issue minor because the only minor back injury there is is one that happens to somebody else. If it's your back, it never really feels like a, a terribly minor injury. So that would be something that I watch very closely with David Bakhtiari over the course of the rest of the season. We'll check in with these numbers throughout the rest of the year as well. I hope they are of some value to you. If they're not, if you have questions, if you think, yeah, just maybe pass on that, let us know. I do appreciate the feedback. If you have questions about how these numbers work or would like access to the full data, I can give you that um, 
that information as well. So I've got for you in this episode. I do hope you appreciated and, and enjoyed what you heard. If you did, please give us a rating and review on the uh, the podcast listening app of your choice. It does help more people find the show. If you want to support us financially, there's a couple ways you can do that as well. Head to patreon.com slash the power sweep to donate a dollar per month to our cause. It helps offset some of our costs. If you want to look good while you support us as well, Check out our fine t-shirts and sweatshirts by clicking the shop link at thepowersweep.com. There's a good-looking selection of stuff there. Check that out for sure. Um, As always, though, a great way to support us is by asking questions, leaving comments, leaving feedback. That, as much as anything else, helps us further our mission of making everybody smarter Packers fans. Because as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We will see you next time on Blue 58.